So you notice there's four names on the here, and there's only two people up here. Yeah, well, the joys of being in operations. Uh, we had an operational issue, so <laughs> uh, Lance and Rudy are going to be off dealing with uh, making sure the systems stay up rather than talking to everybody. But um, we've got all the information, and we know all the goodies. So uh, you probably won't even notice. I just wanted to s <laughs> didn't want to confuse anybody on that. Greg is at least three people. I'm pretty sure. Did you just call me fat? No. <laughs> Wow. Some people will take anything as an insult. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. I don't want to keep you guys waiting and bored. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, my name is Greg Lanche. Um, this is Ken Lett over here. Hello. Uh, I was up until recently part of the Open Source Lab team, um, and I'm kind of the person who uh, started this whole project and then handed off to Ken and the rest of the team, Lance and Rudy, at the OSL. So um, we're going to talk a bit about this project and um, tell you where we were, where we, how we got started, where we went, and then kind of dive into the technology stack a little bit, um, and then talk about where we're going, or where they're going, I should say. I, I still think we. I've, you know, it's my project still, I guess. Um, so before I really get started, um, how many folks here, just a show of hands, are involved in education in some way? Higher ed, K-12? Right on. Nice. I love it. OK, my people are here. This is good. Um, second question is, how many of you are um, not from Oregon? Yeah. Ooh, good, new people. All right, this is going to be fun. Um, so just a quick outline. Um, so uh, Lance and Rudy are um, the two gentlemen that aren't here. They're uh, the operations team. Lance manages the open source lab down at OS Oregon State University. Um, so he and I were the ones that were kind of the leadership team of the lab during my tenure there. I handed everything off to him, and he's doing a great job with it. Rudy is one, is one of our system administrators down there. Ken um, heads up uh, the software development side of the open source lab. So I just kind of give you a, some scope on that. And I was the program manager and founder of the Virtual School District Project that um, came in, designed the initial system that these poor guys now have to go clean up the mess that I made, which we'll talk about later. So um, actually, before I even get this far, uh, just to guys give you all kind of some scope and scale here, um, Oregon has roughly 3 million people in it. Um, we have 200, 198 school districts, about 1,200 schools in the state, um, 550,000 students. So we're not a big state, um, heavily rural. Um, we have, you know, very strong concentration of people here in the Portland metro area, and then lots and lots of very, very small school districts. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is a, so it's an interesting mixture. We have some large urban districts and we have some very rural districts. And so it was kind of an interesting challenge. Um, so back in 2005, uh, I keep stepping away from the mic. I like to walk when I'm talking. I wish I had a laugh. Um, so back in 2005, a study was done um, that made it up way, its way up into the legislature that ranked Oregon 46th in the nation for technology adoption in the classroom. Um, now, the study, I think, was flawed because they did things like they dinged the state for not having a central online virtual school, when in fact there were like nine of them around the state. So you know, I think the, the metrics were flawed, but regardless, these made it to the legislature, and the legislature you know, oh my God, we can't have this happen. Um, and completely flipped out. Oops. There we go. So they did what legislatures like to do. They passed a law. Um, and you're welcome to look this up. It's very simple. It's actually really easy to read. Um, basically just said the State Department of Education shall build a virtual learning online school infrastructure to improve technology adoption in the classrooms. Interestingly enough, that's all they did. Um, so this was very different. This was kind of a surprise to us um, in that they didn't actually dictate to the Department of Education how to do that. They just said, here's $2.2 million for the next biennium. Go make some magic happen, um, which I am eternally grateful for because this could have been a much very, very different project if that had been the case. So the department, and so this created the Oregon Virtual School District. Um, now, we were given that name by the legislature. It's actually written into the law. <laughs> As uh, I'll talk a little bit later, it is neither a school nor a district, but that's okay. Um, so, 
Department of Education suddenly had this huge lump of money, and you know, the, the Department of Education is primarily a regulatory and research agency. You know, they generate statistics, they make sure you know, statewide standards are up to date, they manage testing systems, things like that. They don't do a lot of technology other than some data warehousing, you know, and, and, and reporting and things like that. So they're kind of scratching their heads a little bit going, uh, okay, we need to do this, but we're not quite sure how. Um, and fortunately, uh, there was a visionary in the Department of Education, a fellow named Steve Nelson, um, who unfortunately is a very common name, good luck finding him, but if you want to know, why, know how to get a hold of him, I'll be happy to put you in touch. Um, was aware of the activities at the Open Source Lab, he was aware of the strength of open source. He'd actually been working in state government and other groups dealing with open source stuff and realized, wait a minute, we need open source to do this. Um, and I think this is key because he came to the open source lab and said, okay, we have this need, can you guys help build it? Yay, geeks to the rescue. So he came to me, um, he and I had had a previous relationship, we knew each other, we, we'd worked together in the past, he said, I need your help. Can you help me build this? And I'd been working with community colleges and the, and the uh, universities here in Oregon, um, working on some distance learning applications, things like that. And I said, ooh, this sounds like fun. Yeah, let's build some fun stuff. So let's get to a few definitions here first. Um, as I said, the Oregon Virtual School District is neither a school nor a district. Um, doesn't employ any teachers, doesn't grant any credit, doesn't have any classrooms anywhere in the, in the brick and mortar sense. Um, and this is one thing I heard a lot um, when I initially was getting started on the project and I was out talking to teachers in schools. I go out there and I say, hey, I'm Greg, I'm working with the Oregon Virtual School District, I've got all this great stuff for you, what do you need? And they said, oh great, another unfunded mandate. And I'm like, what? I got $2 million, what are you talking about? So, no. Actually, it is. It's a funded unmandate. It's here. One of the things that was actually included in the law, the law said, you may not charge the schools for the services provided by these systems. Okay, hmm, open source. Great, no problem, we got it. Um, so it is actually funded. It still is funded. So this, uh, it was originally funded in 2006. Um, it's still being funded today. Um, I am, I'm about six months out of date on the current budget status of it, but I believe it's been funded for the next biennium too. Yes, it has. Okay, thank you, Ken. And so we realized, okay, we're geeks. Throw technology at it, it's gonna work, right? No, 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 no. These are teachers we're dealing with. These are human beings, as you know, talking about the keynote this morning, you know, these, these messy humans, you know, they mess everything up. We knew that we couldn't just throw a bunch of technology at it and make it work. So we also engaged with the local education service districts to say, we need a training team, we need a help desk, we need support. Um, we need content. You know, we can't just throw a, throw a website up there and expect them to just use it. Um, that's out of date. That should be six school years. Um, but it's grown just a little bit. We started out with just a few, um, and it's kind of exponentially, virally expanded. Um, and I can kind of, I'll talk a little bit later about how that happened and some of the things that worked and didn't work. Um, and actually, I think that 188,000 users is about six months old, too, so I think it's quite a bit higher than that now, probably over 200,000. Mm -hmm. now, now, note, these are user accounts. Um, there's some squish in those numbers. Um, these are both staff and students. We didn't delimit between staff and students there. Um, and also, there's a, it's kind of a sliding window because students you know, may come in for a quarter and then not be in there for a quarter. So that's the aggregate number of users. So. I love XKCD, sorry, I have to use it in all my, my talks whether you guys like it or not, so feel free to throw things at me. Um, we did a lot of thinking, actually, the sandwich shop right over here, I'm, I'm turned around, I'm not quite sure which direction, just a block from here, so um, a, a friend of mine and I sat down and we actually sketched out on a napkin what we wanted to build. Um, so, you know, it got its start, you know, 100 yards from here. Uh, and we started thinking about, okay, who are these people? Who are we going to be talking to? And who do we need? Who are the key stakeholders we need to get on board with this to make this thing a success so that we can really make a fundamental difference with what's happening in these classrooms out there in the world? Um, so we knew we had to get the administrators on board. I mean, without administrative support, the teachers aren't going to be able to do anything because they're, they're not going to, you know. 
we had to get the teachers out there, and we know teachers are incredibly busy people. We know that if I don't hand a teacher a tool that they can use in the classroom tomorrow, they're going to go, oh, how nice, and walk away. You know, it needs to be something that is instantaneously usable and intuitive enough that they don't have to spend a lot of time learning how to use it. Um, and then we acknowledge that, okay, district IT, especially in school districts, are perennially horribly underfunded. And we knew that if we did anything that made more work for them, they were going to come after us with torches and pitchforks. So we knew that these are kind of our key stakeholders. Um, and the last bit here is in education, especially six, seven years ago, um, open source was not particularly well known at the K-12 level. So, you know, they had this kind of, Im if they even knew of it at all, it was some, you know, long-haired, bearded hippie and they're coding me in their basement. Wait. Oh, yeah, never mind. It's fine, really. Um, so we, we needed to have a little bit of education about what is this kind of fuzzy, wonky, weird, hippie open source thing that we're dealing with. So, this is what we used. I love this slide. It's alphabet soup, only yummier. Um, so most of these tools are pretty standard stuff. You know, Drupal is a major component of it. We built the, the central portal on Drupal that linked out to everything else. Um, Moodle, and everything was built on originally on Apache. Uh, Mahara, which is a variant of Moodle that does e-portfolio work. Um, you know, WordPress, PHP, Linux. Um, that funny little blob in the middle there is Gennetti, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and Jenkins. So that's kind of the stack we built. It started very simple with just Moodle and Drupal. Um, it's kind of created other things as requests have come in for this, that, and the other thing. Um, so I'm going to dive into some of the technology details here. Um, first of all, how many folks here are kind of you know technical, administrative, or you know in the IT department type people? Okay, great. So I, I, I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be, so I wanted to have some tech details, and we can, I have plenty of time for questions and things like that, so we can dive down into the guts of it if you want to know how the gory details of how this was all built. Um, so I'll start kind of at the high level, and then if we, if we need to dive down, I can, I'll be very happy to do so. Um, so since uh, the Open Source Lab at OSU, um, we specialize in hosting. That's what we do. We host virtual machines and physical hardware for open source projects. This is not too different. So we did what we knew. You know, we fired up a virtualization cluster using Gennetti, um, fi fired up a few blade servers, um, started out, actually we started out with two physical servers which, frighteningly enough, are still in service and still grinding away. Um, they're happy, I'm not gonna touch them. Uh, Threw, out, threw some blades into the mix, um, got some back-end database servers going, and then just started kind of growing that cluster as the, uh, as the project grew. Um, originally, we were doing local storage. As the system grew, we needed to start getting into network file systems, things like that, so we rolled out Gluster for that. Um, it's been a mixed blessing. It's worked well. It's easy to configure. Performance, not the best, but you know, with some tweaking, it was, it was again, good enough which a lot of this, a lot of what I did, especially early on, was good enough. <laughs> and that's kind of key, I think. Um, running everything on, originally Gen 2, um, newer systems are now running on CentOS. Doesn't really matter, it's agnostic, you can throw whatever the heck we want in there, it's all Linux, doesn't matter. Um, and then last but absolutely not least is, is configuration management, originally using CF Engine, um, did some stuff in Puppet, and are now in the process of migrating into Chef. Um, and without that, we never would have been able to go this far because, you know, I, I, I was literally a one-person one project for the first four and a half, maybe five years of the project. I was doing everything. I was doing the coding. I was doing the system administration. I had assistance from the team at the OSL for supporting the physical hardware, but I was doing everything, including, you know, some of the training and things like that. So I just did not have time to be messing around with boxes. So configuration management, or I can write the config once and push it out to all the boxes, was the only way I could possibly not have more gray hair than I already do. So we started small. Uh, two boxes. They were decent boxes. They weren't huge, you know, quad cores, nothing huge. Um, they're still grinding away, frighteningly enough. Um, but it was, it was sufficient for what we needed. We just had a few v-hosts, we had you know, a couple of databases, nothing fancy. 
But very quickly, we started getting some big sites on there. We had a large school district. Our friends from Salem Kaiser over here um, came in, third largest school district in the state, wanted to put their website on the system. Fantastic, great. Suddenly, we were getting 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 hits a day where we were, had been getting you know, a few hundred. Um, so immediately, we had to start figuring out, OK, what am I going to do? We threw some caching in there. Um, started going to multiple backends, started going to you know network file system, um, brought up a nice SCSI appliance, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and so we started segmenting things out a little bit because we wanted each district has different needs, each school has different needs. And so we started wanting to separate things out so that we could customize things per district so that we could match, we could sync to their um, particular single sign-on environment. You know, they're using you know Active Directory or whatever. We wanted to be able to be able to hook into that. Um, and so Thing, you know, it, we had kind of this infrastructural scope creep happening. Things kind of started expanding, and we had these one-offs popping up here and there, um, which really helped us in the beginning. It got us the adoption we needed. We got, it got the users out there. We got them using the system, which means the goal of the project was, was being met. But it became more and more and more of a management problem because everything was a little bit different, and it was all stuck here in my head, and I was the only one running it, and I kind of forget things. You know, my brain is Swiss cheese. So, um, recently, in the past year, started really looking at consolidating and rebuilding the infrastructure in a much more standardized form so that, um, you know, one, no one person is a single point of failure. It's not all stuck in my head or stuck in a document somewhere, but that the rest of the team at the open source lab, whether it be the student workers or the, or the other full-time staff, can actually work on the system. Plus, we wanted to build in some more redundancy because we had multiple points, single points of failure in the system. Um, so we started building out this infrastructure. It's actually still on the same physical hardware. It's still on those um, virtualized nodes on Gennetti. But you know, doing things like HA proxy for load balancing, um, running multiple redundant web nodes where all of the sites live on all the web nodes so that rather than segmenting them out by school or district, we put them all in the same pool because they all really need a lot of the same resources and we did the customization in, uh, at other levels rather than at the per machine level, which saved a lot of headaches. It also made things a lot easier for both scalability, you know, things are starting to slow down, throw another web node into the mix, fire it up, we're done. Not a lot of work. Um, it also allowed us to do maintenance and things like that. We could do rolling updates, take a node out of the rotation, update it, put it back in. Take the next one out, update it, put it back in. Um, can you guess where a lot of sysadmins here? <laughs> Um, expanded, um, started using more network file systems. This is where we really got into Gluster and started using Gluster SS for shared files between all those nodes because we had to have all the same files on all the same nodes because we didn't know when a user comes in which node they're going to end up on. Um, and then also expanded the MySQL cluster so we had multiple, mass, multiple slave so that we could actually scale out that. So then, I'm going to hand this off to Ken here in a second, but I want to kind of give the background here. Um, we, you know, about four years in, we started to see some real success. We started to see some real traction. We had schools all over the state. We'd had some contact with every single district, all every one of the 200 districts all over the state. At some point, somebody in that district had logged into the system and, and tried the tools out. Some districts were going in whole hog. You know, we had tens of thousands of users at some districts. Some we had maybe one teacher with a class of five students. Um, and we were constantly in need of some metrics. We, you know, we needed to report back to the legislature at funding time to say, hey, you know, let's, let's show some outcomes here. What's happening? What's working? What's not working? How many users do you have in there? Um, and we kind of, you know, I could scrape through the system and count the number of user counts and things like that. I could tell them how many, you know, virtual servers were running and things like that. Um, but we really needed a lot more there. And so we went to Ken here and said, Ken, we need help because we've got the system that's kind of outgrown this manual structure that we had. And so this is what I'm going to hand it off to Ken now. Yeah. <laughs> so no. so uh, th this slide probably really ought to start uh, with the last point because this was my entry point into the, the project. Gathering statistics from all these thousands of sites, uh, some of them we didn't know where they were, if they were active. We wanted to know things like how many people, how many user accounts are on the site? How many user accounts have actually been used on the site? Were they created and, and never used again? So we began writing uh, some plugins for both Drupal and Moodle. By the way, how many people here are familiar with Moodle? Okay, good. So uh, 
like Drupal, it's a PHP system. Like Drupal, you can write plugins, you can create web services in it. It's much more difficult to work with than Drupal. It's a much larger, more complicated, complex system. But uh, we found that it was not too terribly difficult to get Drupal and Moodle to talk to each other and to gather those statistics we needed. So once we started gathering the statistics and the metrics, we realized we needed some way to gather them all in one place so that we could actually look at them and have some sort of central management for all these thousands and thousands of, of Moodle and Drupal sites. So uh, then we're gonna jump back up to the top of the slide with the ORVSD central. Uh, this was, at some point while writing these plugins, I realized we need a central application to manage all this stuff. Uh, it's actually a, a Python application, but it relies heavily on REST APIs. Uh, we create uh, web services uh, type modules in Moodle and in Drupal so that the central control panel can talk to all those systems. We install a plugin in each one that collects uh, basically everything we can figure out how to collect from each site. How many courses are installed, how many courses are being used, how many users are enrolled. Um, I think there's a few other things. Uh, system details, basically, uh, where that server lives, uh, what its URI, URIs are. And we can gather all that data in one place and generate a report that we can hand to Steve, who can walk into the legislature and say, look, these are all the schools that are using our sites. These are how many users are using, how many students, how many courses. This is what we're actually doing with all the, uh, all the resources that we've been given. So I, I mentioned REST APIs, uh, a little plug for Drupal, working with both Moodle and Drupal. Uh, Drupal is a, a pleasure to work with. It's been really, really nice. Um, writing plugins to talk to other systems is so much simpler. And it's, uh, it, it's becoming a real key to putting all this stuff together because Drupal allows you to have that portal site that people can log into. Drupal can talk to ORVSD Central, find out what courses are available to install on the Moodle site. Uh, we can create, uh, we're in the progress of, of doing this right now. We can create a block in Drupal where people can go log into their school district, see the courses that are available that they can install on their Moodle site, click some, some check boxes and hit a button and everything goes together. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, the other thing we're hoping to do soon is implement Drupal as a user management uh, platform. So each district can go in and add their users to the Drupal site, which has much nicer, cleaner user management tools. And then those, those users are automatically imported into Moodle. You can go directly to your Moodle site. If you're log logged into Drupal, you're auto uh, excuse me, automatically logged into the Moodle site. So that's, it's, been, uh, it's been a great tool for us. Uh, let's see. I think I've mentioned the uh, deploying new, s well, <laughs> we, we're working on deploying courses to Moodle sites using that uh, ORVSD Central and the, the REST APIs. We're hoping to also be able to deploy entire sites. So the, I don't know, on the previous uh, slide, there was a little box off to the side labeled Jenkins. I don't know how many of you might be familiar with Jenkins. It's the, the butler of the sysadmin world. It takes care of things for you. It does things for you reliably uh, when you want them done and in as much detail as you want them done. So uh, ORVSD Central can use those same tools, the same Jenkins API that uh, the infrastructure is using to keep sites updated to deploy entire sites. Uh, so a new district decides they want to get their Moodle and Drupal set up, they can come to us, uh, we can push a button, and voila, their Moodle site and their Drupal site pops up with the correct users, whatever courses they wanted, I'll, I'll put together for them. Um, I think that's, that, that covers most of what I'm doing. Unless you think I should add some more, some more details there. So, I'll turn it back over. So, um, I wanna talk a little bit here about what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then I can dive more deeply into either the te technical side or the educational side, whichever you prefer after we um, go through this real quick. Um, what worked really, really well 
was we ended up going out to professional development events with teachers, um, whether they be conferences. I've, I've been up on this stage in front of a bunch of teachers multiple times in this particular building. Um, talking directly to the teachers because this is because this system doesn't have any cost and because um, it's all hosted remotely. Um, I can hand a user ID and a password to a teacher. I can hand the URL of the site to a teacher and say, "Here, go at it." Um, and within you know five minutes of being registered, they're looking at their course, which they have edit rights on a Moodle server. Um, they are, or they could be looking at a Drupal site if they wanted to. Um, and that was key. You know, it's all about the teachers are busy. If you don't give them something they can use tomorrow, they're not going to use it. This was our way of, okay, I'm going straight to you as a teacher and saying, here, use this. It's free. You get to use it. We, it's supported. We've got a help desk to help you with it. Um, by the way, I, I have to point out, Jackie here is on the help desk. She is absolutely wonderful. She's brilliant. So I have to, yeah, I have to applaud her because she kept me sane for the last five years. <laughs> Um, the other thing we did was we engaged teachers to teach other teachers. Um, as the bottom bullet says, success is viral. So what would happen is we'd get one of those early adopter teachers. And this was one of those weird, difficult kind of contradictions because we wanted to get this in, in the hands of the teachers, um, but we wanted to make it easy enough that any teacher can just pick it up and use it. But in order to do that, we had to attract the power users, which means we also then had to make the tool powerful enough to be attractive to the power users. Um, so what we did was we went straight to those power users and we said, here, we have some tools, we, you know, try them out, tell us what you think, we, we want the feedback, please come yell at me because something doesn't work because I need to know so we can make it better for the teachers who are less savvy than you are. Um, and once we got those teachers going, we got them working in their classroom. Um, you know, they're getting their kids excited. You know, maybe they're actually seeing res better results in the test scores, which we don't have empirical evidence, but um, definitely anecdotal evidence coming from teachers who say use the tools in one of their classes and, and another section didn't. They actually saw a difference in the test scores. They actually saw an improvement in a blended environment where they were. Mm, I forgot to put this in my slides. This is important. Um, these tools were targeted specifically to classroom teachers to enhance what they're already doing in the classroom. This is not a replacement for the classroom. This is not a go do your class online. This is a you have a classroom. We, we are going to hear we are here to help you enhance what you're already doing in the classroom to bring the internet into your class, not to allow teachers to serve 500 students per class. Um, and that was a key thing, I think because the teachers saw this as a tool to do better, not a tool to do more. And I think that's an important, very important fact. But we, so we got these early adopter teachers. We got them in there. We got them working on stuff. They started seeing results. You know, the kids would maybe drop to the next room over and say, you should see what Mrs. Jones is doing over here, man. It's great. It's so much fun. It's so exciting. Or maybe, you know, the teachers are in the lunchroom and they're talking about stuff and they're like, wow, this is working really well for me. I'm seeing results with my students, you know, and the other teachers are going, huh, what's going on over there? Can I get that? And so what we started seeing was we get a teacher really energetic, energized and working with the tool in a school, it would spread. And suddenly we'd have the whole school infected. And then maybe the district, um, and it started getting attention. So when we were trying to get attention, when we were talking about those key stakeholders back at the beginning, the administrators and the IT departments, I talked to them, I got crickets. Nothing. Didn't hear a word. There was no interest, they don't have time to deal with it, they didn't understand the benefit. Got to the teachers, got the teachers starting using it, they went, yeah, right, let's go. And then all of a sudden the teachers, and the, uh, the administrators in the IT departments are going, hey, what's going on over there? What, what, what's all this noise? What's this virtual school district stuff? Why am I seeing all this traffic going to an external server? Um, which, as I'll get to, is some of the things that didn't work. Um, actually, I'll get to it now. Oh, wait, no, I won't. I'll talk about the technical stuff first. So because this is a state-funded project and because we're at the whim of the legislature, we wanted to make sure that if the legislature tomorrow is zero-funded the project, we didn't completely leave the schools in the lurch. Now I know there's, you know, you can't just forklift something and drop it in a school data center and expect it, or a district's data center and expect it to work. I, mean, I totally understand that. But we could at least do what we could to mitigate that. And the first thing is let's not tie them to a large proprietary software licensing bill. You know, especially these districts with, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 students on the system. Um, you know, they're already pressed for, for money. That's one of the reasons we're rebuilding the system. Let's provide them tools without costing them anything. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we built, we could turn over to their school IT department and say, here are the tools. This is what we built. Here is the code. 
um, you can do this, we will help you do this. And I said this multiple times to the IT departments that I worked with. If you want to bring this in-house, great, I will help you do it. You know, you don't have to wait. You know, if you want to do this now, you like what you see, I will come down to you and sit down with your IT department and help you deploy it internally. We love that because that, as far as I'm concerned, better serves the goal of the, di the, of the project than just having them run on our servers because that's something locally managed, locally owned. The control is where it needs to be. I'm very much in pushing that control as far out to that edge as I can. We don't want to control and tell people what to do with the system. We want the users to define how that system's getting used. Um, using a cloud-like model, we were really running a, a private virtual cloud. Worked well because it was it enabled us to spin up servers, spin down servers, reconfigure servers, do things very in a sort of very agile manner. When we get feedback from schools or we see traffic increasing, we were able to adjust to it quickly. Um, config management, I already mentioned. We were running so many systems, there is no way we would have been able to run that many systems without it. It, it is a complete lifesaver. As crufty as CF Engine is, it's got its warts and it's arcane as hell. Um, it got us past that initial growth spurt. It got us to the point where we were big enough that we could start dedicating the resources to actually working more on the infrastructure. So um, config management it was definitely key here. Um, and the Jenkins bit, the ability to automate things like server and course creation. Um, made everything work, you know, both with Jenkins and as well, I had some crufty PHC scripts that I wrote initially to do that, to automatically create sites and automatically create courses, um, were key because we didn't want those teachers to have to wait. Again, there's that not waiting thing. Teachers should be able to sign into the site, say, I, you know, look at the, uh, the library of courses that are available, say, I want that physics course on my server with control. They're able to do that without having to wait for any, any human being, whether it be me or somebody at their district, to approve that. They just do it, um, which, again, I'll get to is one of the things that didn't work. So some of the things that caused problems. One, we were a little too aggressive in talking to the teachers and not aggressive enough in talking to the IT staffs. So what did we get? We got a lot of crossed arms. We still, we still do, I think. Um, it's fair. It's, it's a completely valid and reasonable problem that the, this, that the district IT had with us because we were this unknown outside vendor coming in from the statewide level, you know, saying, here, teachers, have all this stuff. And of course, the IT departments are going, one, I don't understand this stuff because a lot of them are Microsoft shops, you know, and it's, it's a threat. It really is. You know, it's like, gosh, there's all this technology coming into my district. I'm responsible for technology in my district, and I don't understand what my teachers are using. This is a problem. And so at some districts, um, it was pretty severe. You know, we had grievances filed. We had all sorts of things happen. It was a very unpleasant, negative interaction, which I really regret and I wish, you know, if I could just go back five years and do it over again, I'd, I'd try to find a way to do it differently. Um, yes, the program's succeeding. Yes, we're making a very strong impact in the classrooms, but at the cost of driving even a further wedge between the teachers and their IT staff locally. Because um, the IT staff saw, saw this as, oh my god, this is going to make more work. Um, even though I, I argue, yeah, we have you know, the help desk and things like that to assist, I understand the complaint and it's totally valid. Um, also, it was a bit of the non-invented here thing, you know, especially at the larger districts. The IT departments at the larger districts especially were like, oh, there's these outsiders, these, you know, these wild, hairy hippies coming in telling us how you, they can do better stuff than we can. And we've got a great system here. We know exactly what we're doing. We have all these tools. We can do all of what you're giving. Why are you coming in and doing this to our teachers? We can do this ourselves. True. But clearly something's not stinking here because the teachers were still coming to us wanting to use the tools rather than going to the local IT department. So yeah, there was a definite disconnect there and there was a definite sort of a, a bit of butting heads that we didn't handle well. Um, the other problem we had was just plain enthusiasm. And that seems a little odd, but uh, as I had this image at one point where one of the districts I worked with um, had been had rolled out Moodle, they were they had a bunch of their students. It was an alternative high school. They were really excited. Things were going great, and then they got this grant to get a bunch of iPads, and they started doing stuff. And I had this image in my head of them running around with iPads, banging down nails, because they you know the iPad was suddenly. I mean this was 
three, four years ago, you know, the iPads were still very much a very new hot thing and people hadn't quite figured out how to use them intelligently in the classroom yet. And so they were using them in wholly inappropriate ways. And they got really excited about it and they rolled this out and it fell flat on its face because they had this shiny hammer when what they really needed was, you know, maybe a wrench or a screwdriver. Um, and we didn't necessarily help handhold them on that um, and didn't do a particularly good job of helping them understand when, what, a you know, helping them figure out what the appropriate tool is and the appropriate application of the tools that they had. Um, so they got overly enthusiastic, they did some great stuff and some stuff that didn't work so well. The last thing is um, when we originally built the portal, um, I wanted to build a strong social component that connected teachers cross district all over the state to allow them to share content. You know, hey, I did this really great unit on you know fractions. I want to share this with other elementary school teachers in the state. So I built this, had this whole structure, had this way of you know allowing teachers to upload content and rate it, and um, crickets. As, a, as another speaker I heard earlier this week say, tumbleweeds. Not a single object was uploaded. Nothing. Uh, and I, you know, I talked to the teachers and there were some concerns. There were things like, well, you know, if I create this stuff, is it, the, is it my intellectual property? Is it the district's intellectual property? You know, I, you know, I don't want to have, and, and, and also part of it is, again, teachers just don't have time. They were looking for content. They didn't have the time to generate their own necessarily and contribute it back. Um, they like the idea, um, as, uh, as one of my friends in public administration likes to stay, and, and in volunteerism. Um, collaboration, they love the idea of collaboration. It's kind of like teen sex, everybody's talking about it, but nobody's actually doing it very well. Same sort of thing. You know, they really worked hard at it, they liked the idea, but it just never really came to anything, um, which is a great disappointment to me, but it's the reality of the world. So things that we stumbled over technology-wise. Um, as the, site, the system started to peripherate, we got more and more sites out there, it become, became much, much, much harder to keep things updated and patched. We had so many different configurations, so many different versions, primarily Drupal 6 stuff, now getting into Drupal 7. Um, we even had Drupal 5 stuff floating around out there. Um, I think up until last year, I, actually they may still be running for all I know, um, there were still Drupal 5 sites running in production because there was just too much there and the effort to upgrade those and keep them patched because they were all a little bit different um, was a problem, which is one of the reasons we started moving to the Jenkins model and the more standardization of things. Um, as, a re as a related thing, way too many one-offs. We had WordPress sites up there where they're kind of floating out on their own. We had, you know, WordPress multi, you know, WordPress MU or whatever, you know, the ne WordPress network stuff that he worked up at some point. We had all these things and they were all configured different. Um, and, you know, we had no standardization because we tried to standardize the structure. We had, you know, maybe a server at the district level and a server per school. Some districts wanted everybody on one server. Some districts wanted them per school. And so things, you know, as try as we might, we tried to standardize, couldn't do it. And so it became this kind of mishmash of, okay, wait, is Portland on one server or is it on eight? Okay, yeah. And, and so it became a very difficult thing to manage. Um, the other thing is, and this is our probably mm -hmm. our greatest technical failure, was um, we had an iSCSI storage appliance that failed hard uh, exactly a year ago this week actually yep, isn't it yep. It was Memorial Day weekend yep. um, completely blew up on us um, lost I think we managed to resurrect almost all of the data but we had a significant downtime in the system it was a bad single point of failure um, which is one of the reasons we went to Gluster um, because you know we had then multiple copies spread across multiple machines, um, and even though the storage array was supposed to be redundant, it turned out it wasn't. We had you know a card go bad and it spewed a bunch of bad data onto the systems, lost multiple volumes. It was a, a very bad situation. Um, so the one thing we learned the most was yeah, don't trust that damn appliance. <laughs> so we've got let's see about 15, 20 minutes for questions and, and discussion, and I can dive down into any of the technical details, or Ken can talk about some of the software level stuff. Um, I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for talking about this, because I wasn't quite sure who was gonna be here today. So uh, I encourage anybody with a question, come on up to the mic here, and uh, let's chat. <laughs> uh, 
I actually work in a school district, and I have a question about how do you guys handle the aging of everything in the system? You know, schools mm -hmm. run, you know, we kind of run for a year, then we burn everything down and we start up for a new mm -hmm. year. I mean, are, do you guys looking at having high school students finding their kindergarten records still on the system, or is there some sort of method of removing the old to keep everything running? Mm -hmm. um, we actually had explicit instructions from the Department of Ed not to remove old user accounts. Um, they wanted to keep those around. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, um, but what we ended up doing with a lot of districts is uh, there were you know certainly namespace issues, you know especially when you're talking statewide. I mean there are namespace issues in any large district, and when you're starting to talk about statewide, we really had naming convention issues, um, and so siloing them off using like graduation year and things like that um, tended to help. But for the most part, also uh, up until very recently, we hadn't done a lot with single sign-on. So, um, you know, as a, as a student would move into a new school, their account wouldn't necessarily travel with them. They'd get a new account at the new school. And f the schools, a lot of the schools, we hooked them into the, the school Active Directory. And so a lot of that just got aged out anyway because they removed the account from Active Directory, pfft, it gets taken off the system, they're done. Um, but it, it, it hadn't been much of a problem, but that does also account for some of the bloat in the user numbers that we see. Yeah, yeah, they're recording, so we'll need to get it on the microphone. Thank you. Um, so you you mentioned your experiences with iPads. Has has that situation gotten better? Are you are you able to to integrate, mm -hmm. right, you know, right. storing stuff, you know, that they do natively on the iPad and 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 get it into Moodle smoothly? Um, I I know that the very recent versions of Moodle have gotten better as far as content creation on iPad, um, uh, but. Yeah, it's it's an issue regardless. I think a lot of the schools and the teachers are starting to figure out that iPads are great consumption devices. They work really good for looking at things and maybe interacting with things, but when they get into the state where they're, they're needing to submit content, um, generally they go to the laptop part or the computer lab right, and, and get on a real keyboard because it just it was too frustrating for them. Does, uh, does today's Moodle interface well? Um, with iPads? Or it's gotten better. Touches? Yeah, it, it, it does some detection on mobile devices and actually provides the ability to do a mobile theme, which is decent. It's not truly responsive, which is certainly something that, you know, the Drupal world has done. And I know that there's a lot of work, especially in the Drupal community, to start seeing about replacing a lot of those functions in Moodle in Drupal, which I would kill for. Because I mean, you know, working with Moodle has reminded me just how much I adore how Drupal core is set up. Um, from a technical standpoint, um, yeah, dealing with Moodle core is a nightmare. Um, so anything you know we could do to, to try to push stuff in, you know, even using WordPress instead of Moodle, um, just getting away from the Moodle interface because it's heavy, bloated, and difficult to work with. Um, it's still used. The teachers like it. They have the mind share. So you know, we did what we could, but there isn't a whole lot you can do. And uh, one other question. So in, in Oregon, is this is this open to other schools um, in terms of private schools or homeschoolers? Ah, good question, yes. Um, it is open to any student or teacher who is connected with a public school district. Um, so private schools, unfortunately, are not included. They're excluded by law. It wasn't our choice. That's the way it is. I would have opened it up to everybody if I had my choice. Um, but we were excluded by, uh, private schools were excluded by law. A lot of home schools are included though because most of the homeschooling is done through the local district of the local ASD. So a lot of homeschool students can use, this, use the system. That said, the system is primarily targeted at teachers. So, you know, it's tools for teachers more than tools for students. There was a goal of, in, in, in the initial diagrams we drew of having a student portal that had a bunch of content for students. Um, that never really materialized. Um, there, that we just didn't have the demand and we didn't have the resources to build it. Um, but any teacher who's working with a student, regardless if that student's a homeschool student or an in-classroom student is, uh, uh, that is employed by a public school entity is able to use it in Oregon. Yeah, unfortunately, again, it's, yeah. That said, um, you know, I... I well, what we're doing is all open source software. Yeah. So all the content that we're creating, all the plugins that we're creating are open source, and we're happy to share our expertise and our, our systems. We can't host your site if you're from another state, but we'd be happy to uh, share those uh, those setups. And plug A lot of stuff's on GitHub, yeah. which, um, yeah, ping one of us and we'll get you GitHub access. <laughs> yeah. 
I work for a county office of ed in California, mm -hmm. um, and I too have gotten into trouble by being a crusader rabbit to the teachers saying, no, just go out and sign up for these things and just go do it. Don't wait for mm -hmm. your district to, to do this. And I've gotten into some trouble for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of sitting back and, and cackling now as I'm seeing this this wave of devices just wash over the <laughs> IT department that I work for. You know, I'm mm -hmm. saying, all right. Even our office tried to ban iPads, and, and that lasted like two weeks, <laughs> you know, before the iPads just started just washing in, yep. and now we're actually, you know, the, all, the, all of our divisions want to do these experimental iPad programs where they're buying 100 at a time, and, you know, yeah. that's, that's not an experiment, folks. You're deploying. The ban uh, superintendent buys one. Uh, yeah. Yes. Exactly. But, but I know in... <laughs> oh, there you go. sneaky, there you sneaky! Go. I like it. But is it uh, our IT departments becoming more reasonable with teachers now? Are they because it's happening they're in corporations? Risk. People are bringing in their own yeah. technology, and even buying decisions such as whether or not to buy Drupal is is yeah. moving in corporations. Yeah. It seems more to the to the actual users and has less yeah. to do with the IT department. Are you perceiving that happening? I, to some extent, yeah. Uh, I think there, there are kind of a few things happening. Um, one is or a truly unfortunate thing, which is budgets are getting so tight, there are no IT departments in some districts. I, I remember getting a call not long ago from a, from a superintendent in a rural district said, hey, I need help with this. This isn't working. And I said, oh, gosh, it looks like it's something to do with your single sign-on and your active directory. Yeah, like, get me in touch with your IT department. I'll, I'll help them work through it. I am the IT department. They all got laid off last month. What am I going to do? You know, I and mean, we tried to help them as best we could, but um, you know, without access to the systems or what, you know. So that's one thing is, you know, just out of sheer attrition, the teachers don't have an IT department to work with any longer. So they're they just, you know, they're grasping at whatever resources they can get just to get their job done. Um, and so that is actually, unfortunately, part of the growth. Um, I think also there are districts that, because there is so much pressure on them financially especially, or they're just getting better educated, they're starting to learn, they're seeing stuff like this going on. Um, they're like, okay, yeah, we can, we can do this, we can get our toes in it, we can, you know, and now that there's somebody else that's done it, you know, I mean, this is the great public sector thing, right? You don't want to be first, you, you always want to see, I want to see somebody else has done it first. So now that we can start pointing at districts that say, look, you know, these guys at Salem-Kaiser, they're doing it right now, they've completely offloaded their website. You know, they're saving however many thousand dollars a year on this. It's okay. It doesn't hurt. And the other districts can go, well, if those guys are doing it, we can do it. That's no problem. Um, so we're starting to see that. And there are a few districts that saw the light from the beginning. You know, there are a couple of districts out there that, you know, Google Apps came out. That was part of this that we did talk about in the presentation is actually Oregon was the first state in the country to sign a statewide Google Apps contract, Google Apps for Education. So every single public school in Oregon has free access to Google Apps for Education, the full suite. Um, you know, first one to do a statewide agreement on that. Um, so, you know, they're, they're doing these things. There's districts that just threw it wide open, you know, that I, there's one in uh, the Newburgh School District here in Oregon. I, I love those guys. They're amazing. They just said, you want to try it? You want to try open source stuff? Great. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. Um, and, and they totally embraced this sort of disruptive attitude, and it's worked great for them. So, you know, there are a few out there that's done that, but it's, yeah, unfortunately, attrition seems to be the worst. Um, but most common reason. Do you guys feel like your uh, system is pretty well stabilized, or are there uh, major kind of user-facing components you're thinking hey, about adding? Lance is here. Great. Yeah, I think the changes we've made in the you know in the past year have certainly made it a lot more stabilized. Um, we still have a ways to go, but we've definitely redesigned it in a way that it's a lot more robust. Are there other open source projects or you know features um, that you get requests for or are personally interested in that you think would make a good addition to it? To uh, the ORVSD infrastructure specifically? Not right now. I mean, we've already tapped into quite a bit of things, like GlusterFS being the latest development and working that out has certainly helped quite a bit. I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah, I mean, this. Well, I think this, Jenkins was another big thing. For yeah, us. and that, that's one thing I, I, I didn't actually talk very much about is the automated deployment on Jenkins and the fact that we're actually doing entirely automated upgrades of both Moodle and Drupal via Jenkins. Um, and even to the point of sharing Git repos with the school district IT for them to upload their own modifications into, and then Jenkins deploys it to staging when they do a commit to the staging branch. They get to try it out on staging. Um, 
if it's if it's working okay, then we merge staging into prod, and Jenkins immediately deploys it to prod, um, which has saved a huge amount of work. Um, now, that's not a user-facing thing that they're necessarily going to notice, but it does allow the local district and us, um, what the OSL teams, I keep thinking of us, um, to, to do stuff more quickly. But I think between you know the ePortfolios on Mahara, which n never really caught on, Moodle um, and Drupal and WordPress, I mean, those tools seem to be the key ones. The teachers just want a website that can put stuff on and have the teachers and the students go look at. That's all I really cared about. <laughs> Does your setup communicate with any student information systems? <sighs> Vast number of districts did not want us to do that. Uh, that there was very much firewall issues involved a lot of times, and they just that, and that was where some of the resistance with the IT staff came in. Is like no way in hell am I letting somebody outside do something. Um, the closest we've come is hooking into say you know their LDAP or Active Directory, um, but pushing data into and out of the student information systems um, while we were willing to do it, um, the other half generally wasn't, um, which is kind of I think a blessing in disguise because that is a hairy, nasty, ugly problem, and I'm kind of glad we didn't have to address it yet because that would have been a lot of work. <laughs> so does each district have their own information yes. system? Okay. Yes, okay. and it's the dog's breakfast out there, yeah. everything. I mean, there are districts that were still doing things with Excel for their SIS. Wow. We have some really small districts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if there was any ability to track uh, or any metrics for student success, uh, especially across years, or is it is everything yeah. expunged? Um, it, yeah, it's not necessarily year? expunged, um, but for the most part, and it kind of ties in with the, the student information system thing, is that teachers, while there are gradebook functions, say in Moodle and things like that, teachers were really using their local SIS for um, all of that. So yeah, we didn't, we didn't have the metrics. I wanted to gather them, we just didn't have any way to. Uh, we're starting to be able to gather more metrics on all the sites through the, the ORVSD Central program, and that's kind of only limited by what kind of data we can gather from Moodle and Drupal. So uh, Moodle tracks a certain amount of you know, student success depending on you know, how they've got it set up. So in the future, we might be able to do something a lot more detailed and comprehensive, uh, you know, rates of, of uh, how many people got A's in, in certain courses, how many people completed which material, that kind of stuff, so yeah. What level of hardware vir virtualization were you able to achieve? Do you, um, for instance, do you have a network fabric um, so that the network um, connections are all virtualized? Um, do you have? Uh, I'll let Lance, Lance answer that one. I could answer it, but he'll do it better. <laughs> um, I mean, we use KVM as the hypervisor in all of our virtualization. I think um, one of the sites kind of showed the new architecture. Basically, the database servers are hardware. The file servers are hardware, um, and then we have the physical nodes. I mean, there's a couple of older machines that are still physical hardware, but those are going away. Um, so I would say, on average, probably 80 to 90 percent of the infrastructure okay. is virtualized. But networking-wise, so like it's your, just your the, file servers are, are in fact nodes. They're their own. They're the the, cl the cluster FS nodes. So um, we. I don't know if you described how we split up the file systems on some of the stuff, but no, I didn't get that. Um, you said that you got rid of your your one file server appliance, I assume that this is doing some kind of raid in, in software. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, all of them has raided, yeah. Yeah, we still so have an older you. NFS server that's by itself, but we have been replicating stuff off of it for like a cold backup, but the new system with GlusterFS kind of does it more automatically. And so we've had to split some things up because GlusterFS does not work really well if you have PHP files on it. So we have to, that's why we have Jenkins to kind of have all the PHP files on the local file system and then like is Moodle it, data the, and Drupal are the, files are on Gluster. Is it just too slow to, to bring the PHP in in a timely fashion? It's, it's the type of, the way GlusterFS works and the type of system calls that it does, it's just incredibly slow. It doesn't deal, deal well, well with small files in PHP. Um, Have you used any kind of SSD caching to try to speed things up? What we've done is much caching as we can do, okay. basically. But this is the solution we've had. and, and Basically, all of the advice we've gotten from GlusterFS is the same thing. You know, don't host the PHP files on GlusterFS. Okay. Um, yeah. Use a, yeah. Use a lot of memcache. Heavily use Varnish on the front end for caching of static, static assets. Um, basically, I mean, you know, just like any other large-scale Drupal or PHP site in general, is just you know do whatever you can to reduce the number of hits on the PHP backend, so we don't have to actually ever touch disk. Um, so lots of stuffs cached in, in memcache and RAM, and what we can is cached on the front end in Varnish. 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the Gennetti logo. <laughs> yeah, I, I that's know. a we, fairly new logo. <laughs> we, yeah, we put the slides together, and I, I saw this logo up here, and I'm like, "What the heck is that?" You know, I've been working with the Gennetti for like six years, and I don't know what it is. So yeah, that's that's a new one. You you had some numbers up there about the um, number of sites that you have, like yes. 500 or, or 750 websites. Are those a combination of Drupal and yeah, Moodle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's preponderance of the Moodle. Um, it's probably 90% Moodle sites, mostly oh. because um, the, in the original iteration of the site, um, the, the Drupal portal, um, when a teacher signs in and they go browsing the content, um, I had I created a, a Moodle module that Ken hates me for. Don't, he, don't let him tell you otherwise. He hates me for it. Um, it's awful, crufty PHP thing that basically would, um, when, when teacher signs up, they say what school district and what school they're with. Uh, when they go to say, oh, I like this piece of content, I want to create a course based on it, they hit create a course, the system would then check the back end, see if a server exists, a, a virtual vhost for that particular school. If it doesn't, it would spawn one, it would load Moodle into it, it would then load the course into it, it would add the user, and then it would give them the link back to the course. But what that meant was every curious teacher that goes, oh, that's kind of fun, click that button, new server. So you know it was good because then they had it and it, you know, we never have to create it again and it was fine. But there are you know probably a couple of hundred, if not more, servers sitting there that have one user on them that oh. has never been logged in. So uh, the Moodle, I, I'm not familiar with the, the learning system. Uh -huh. Okay, but the, the Drupal part, uh -huh. um, that's for everything else, right? The, yes. The courseware is that software and everything else is. Although we do have teachers doing things in Moodle and in WordPress both because more often than not, Moodle is way overkill for what the teachers actually yeah. wanted to do. They just wanted a place to like maybe have a discussion and um, have students, you know, download assignments or, you know, put the syllabus up there or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it depends on the teacher's needs. And that was one of the kind of the weird things is we had this huge variation on what the teachers were using it for. Some teachers did the entire class on there. They used the quiz, they used the, you know, the assignment module for assignment submissions. They had tons of stuff on there in Moodle. Some of them are like, yeah, I post my lecture notes up there. So, yeah, it, it varied wildly. So, um, my question about Drupal is, is um, since you probably have a lot of those sites as well, mm -hmm. how do you, I guess you have to have a standard list of modules that you, yeah. so that people don't go off the the rails here and create crazy websites that you have to maintain. Um, so you you set exactly what they get, and so that you can scale up to a lot of websites. The initial set, yes. However, um, they they do have the ability of uploading um, site specific modules and using them if they want to. Okay. Yeah, you know, we we gave them plenty of opportunities to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, <laughs> You know, partly because we just didn't have the staff to, to you know, manage at that level. And two, we wanted to give them the control, you know. Sure. And, you know, with, you know, yes. we, I, I did the, you know, with great power comes great responsibility speech to them. Oh, you know, it's like, okay, you know, well, I'm going to give you this access, but I want you to know if you do the wrong thing, you're going to blow up your site. And we'll try to help you, but, um, you know, don't be stupid. <laughs> right. So, so, so I, I guess my final thought is, is, is question rather is, um, so how are you, is this a multi-site environment? Is it single sites? I, that's yes. really what I was getting at. <laughs> the answer to that is yes, unfortunately. Things, right? um, and Ken and Lance can talk more because it's changed significantly. Yeah, I, I want to say originally it was multi-site, and I think the new architecture is not. Yes. Um, simply because the multi-site problem was, well, if I upgrade this one source repository, then everything has to get upgraded all at once, and we didn't want to work, we didn't want to work around that, so that's where Jenkins kind of tied in where it kind of did that more automatically. At least that's how I recall it being set up now. Yeah, well what we discovered really was there's kind of a sweet spot for where multi-site really made sense in the number of sites, you know, and so for a very small number of sites, um, you know, single sites is probably fine because you're only dealing with, you know, four or five web routes. Um, you get into the eight or 10 or 12 site, maybe 15 sites, uh, multi-site, yeah, that made me make a little more, more sense, but then it, as that number grows, it begin, then it becomes more unwieldy again because you, do you really want to pull the trigger and upla up, upgrade 150 sites all at once? You know, something is going to blow up, and so it's much nicer to be able to batch those. Uh, and I think, um, I don't see the Oregon State folks here right now. Uh, OSU on Tuesday did a talk on, yeah, same problem, exactly the same issue. Yeah, and so we ended up doing something, we, we did it in a slightly different way, um, but it, it's exactly the same problem, yeah. 
So yeah, I would go, if you have large numbers of sites, I would strongly recommend using some sort of continuous integration tool like Jenkins and deploying single site, uh, unless you have a compelling reason why you would want to do multi-site. I think we're about out of time. Yeah. Oh, we are, I'm sorry, yes. We are out of time, okay. Well, I was just wondering, um, I'm not a teacher, but um, where do curious teachers go? Is there a central uh, website that I missed the URL for? No, and I'm silly and forgot to put it in there, but it's orvsd.org. And uh, this site has, this was, this originally went online five years ago. It has not changed since, so I apologize, but it works. So, you know, yeah, orvsd.org. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for going long. <laughs>